Ladies and gentlemen, we begin with clap once. We begin with clap twice. We begin with clap three times. Hello, my name is Keith Stanley. I'm the executive director of the Neil Strike Brothers and also uh, Avenue's West Association. Uh, and I'm here to thank Keith Stanley and the Neil Strike Brothers and also Avenue's West Association. It's so good to see so many familiar faces in the room. Uh, I, I'm always excited about our Avenue's West luncheon. We can talk about very interesting topics. We're just a little behind, and we hope everything is going well for you. There's some beautiful cupcakes there, and if you're not going to eat yours, you can get it to me. Uh, and I'm happy to take care of it for you. Uh, a couple of things I want to highlight. On your seat, you will see uh, September Guide to the Near West Side. Uh, we have had a busy, busy month in the Near West Side. Uh, on Tuesday, we have Rev Up. Uh, we have Farmer's Market each Thursday. Uh, then this weekend, the doors open. Um, we ask, we're asking people if you can, take a look at the different sites. The more speakers you get at the different sites, we'll allow you to win prizes. Even a, a, a one night stay here at the Avengers Hotel is dinner. We also have some uh, Marquette University swag to give out. How the Davidson swag to give out. It's a whole bunch of cool things. So we ask you, so if you can, take this guy and go visit our neighborhood and visit some of these businesses and some of these sites. So that's the first thing. Uh, and then I also want to say, we talk a little bit about Doors Open. Doors Open is this weekend, uh, Saturday and Sunday. We have 14 different sites in the near west side. We ask you to please do check them out. They're um, really cool sites. So they who been to the Triple I Shrine Center, if you have, raise your hand. Anybody been to the Triple I Shrine Center? It's open. Um, have you, we all here at the Ambassador Hotel. We get a behind the scenes look at the Ambassador Hotel this weekend. We also have the Mobile Design Box, Central Standard Distillery and a host of other um, uh, sites, including um, Hands in Harmony, which is one of our businesses from uh, our Rebel competition. Uh, did anybody, who attended the Rebel competition on Tuesday? It was exciting. We had our winner, uh, Alan Newman, uh with the bakery. We're excited to we get him in his neighborhood the next year or so. We're pretty excited about that. Um, so without further ado, I will, we have a couple more announcements to bring the panel up. Uh, I want to bring up Dan Bergen, who's director uh, of community engagement at Market Universities for a couple quick announcements and then you hear my voice right before the panel. Let's give it well, It's great to be here today and I want to extend a special thanks and gratitude to Keith Stanley for the invitation to be here. Of course, Market University is deeply committed to the Avenue's West neighborhood and the broader New West Side, the New West Side partners. So thank you. Um, just wanted to draw your attention to uh, a couple of items that are coming up, two particular events that are relevant to today's conversation. Uh, the first is that the is the SDC Summit on Poverty and Swim Conference be occurring on October 7th and 8th at the Wisconsin Center. And we've got four dynamic keynote speakers who will be there during those two days. The first, Dr. Mark Lamont Hill uh, from Temple University. Uh, second, Reverend Dr. William Barber. Second. Uh, yes. <laughs> so he'll be joining us from uh, the Poor People's Campaign, of course, his, his, uh, his, um, his yeah, the Motivational Mondays, the, the Moral Mondays. Moral Mondays, thank you. Yeah, I always forget the end. Thanks, um, Reverend. Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, Dr. Shiley Jane will be coming to us uh, from the University of uh, California, uh, actually at Stanford University in California. Uh, she does PTSD work. Trauma work. Um, so she'll be joining us. And then Dr. Monica White, who's actually the first African American Black College of Agriculture college, uh, associate professor in their history. Um, so she uh, was recently tenured there, uh, and so she's their first tenured faculty member. She speaks on uh, black farming and uh, agricultural resistance in our history. So hope to see you there. Uh, one of the aspects in, around the conference that has come up, I just want to be clear about, uh, is that the fee. Many people in the community have asked about the fee and the cost of the conference. And I want to tell you all that it is, um, there are scholarships available for anybody who needs them. So there are scholarships, it is theoretically everybody in the city could attend this conference for free. Um, so we do, we do have a $200 fee for the, the two-day event. Um, if you can't afford that, we would ask that you pay that. Um, uh, otherwise, uh, please feel free to uh, take a scholarship. And then lastly, very briefly, uh, we have on November 12th our community engagement symposium there. And, and this year we are doing an interesting approach. We're going to have Brady Crosby, 
from Johnson Controls uh, deliver a 10-minute keynote. Maya Jones, who's a postdoctoral fellow at MCW, 10-minute keynote. We got Janan Najib, who will be presenting from the Muslim uh, Women's Center uh, and for the coalition. And Shantay Nelson, who is a Wisconsin State Director for All Voting is Local and Tracy Sparrow. Each will give a 10-minute uh, uh, keynote delivered, and uh, you all are invited to join them, followed by a workshop there. So, those are my two announcements. You have these, uh, these flyers are actually outside on the table as you need, so please feel free to grab them, and I want to extend my gratitude again to you for having me. Uh, and just before I bring up Alicia Newman, uh, real quick, Alicia Kendrick Newman, right? I'm going to get her out of here. Newman Kendrick. So, uh, real quick, just a little history. Uh, Alicia and I went to Alabama State University together <laughs> almost 20 years ago. <laughs> uh, we were hornets at the time, going around the campus, thinking we were all that. Uh, I was next. Uh, we, we thought we came in. This is the era of a different world, you know? <laughs> we was, we was coming in, you know? Um, but uh, I will say, and this is going to get into the, the intro of the panel, but it was important to me because, with, as we all can see, mental health and how it affects our community. Here in the Midwest side, we have 125 nonprofits. We work with trying to provide the support that brothers and sisters need, but it was important to me because I see how it affects us on a daily basis. Um, whether it's housing, call your life, it bothers me. And my, my, my emotional heart strings went out. I've been able to see both Dr. Jones and Dr. Smith on television. And I reached out to them and I said, like, I gotta have you guys because they they understand the pain. They appreciate the process of what we need to do as a community to heal ourselves. And then it was logical for Alicia to be able to see the Milwaukee Department of Health that we bring that in. So without further ado, we have about a 45 minute discussion here. It is being taped on Facebook Live, so if you didn't get a chance to hear something, you can go back to the video tape. With that said, let's give a warm welcome to Venetia. Health Division, um, and what I do is I have the great opportunity of going into some of our schools, working with some of our youth-based organizations, um, churches, pretty much anyone that will allow me to come and speak and talk about adolescent suicide, which is a very important, um, a very important topic to discuss, especially right now. Our children are hurting, and we definitely want to make sure that we take the opportunity to get to them before they make some drastic decisions. So, my job today, I serve as the moderator. So, I won't be saying a whole lot, unfortunately. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I do want to make sure that if you guys happen to have any questions for the panelists, please make sure that you let us know, especially even during the discussion. Please take that opportunity to ask that question. If not during the discussion, we will definitely provide that opportunity um, towards the end of, of the panel discussion. So with that being said, I would like to invite Drs. Ramel Kwaku Smith and Dr. Smith to the floor. I'm sorry, Dr. Jones to the floor. <laughs> for giving some very vital information centered around mental health and wellness. So if any of this information becomes overwhelming, please make sure that you take care of yourself. Your self-care is very important, okay? So, with that being said, we're gonna go ahead and start the panel discussion. Are y'all okay with that? Yes, okay. <laughs> so, we're gonna start with Dr. Smith. Um, if you will, can you please share just a little bit about yourself and why you decided to have a career focusing on mental health and wellness? 
How's everybody doing? Midship, midship. So uh, I just like to give everybody a disclaimer and a warning, even though I'm not a title of a doctor, sometimes my words don't always come out with what's, uh, I guess, a typical of a doctor. So to answer that question is, I was raised in a house of our people. There's a lot of professors, there's a lot of pastors, a lot of prophets, a lot of preachers. Uh, in addition, there's a lot of pimps and players and prostitutes and pushers. So if you can imagine, there's a lot of different things and ways in which I was taught. Some, some good, some not so good. Went to school for a long time, but the best learning I ever got was from my maternal grandmother from Chickasaw County, Houston, Mississippi. She said the best way to heal yourself is to help others. So I don't think that you become a psychologist, I think you're born a psychologist or you're going to help or even haven't been a psychologist, I would have did something to help people in the form. It's because I received so much help going up. It's because I had so much pain going up that I wanted to be able to help them. And I wanted to be able to help others as others help me. So when we think about why does a person kind of gravitate to the field then, usually it's because it's something very personal. It's an innate gift that you have and then the, the stresses, the, the pressures, and the love of life have to uh, really move you to that next point. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, similar experiences. Uh, I think we, we've all uh, somewhat grown, grown up around people with have dealt with some kind of mental health needs, and so um, very similar to Dr. Smith. Um, not just my family, but also friends, uh, colleagues, and also people in the community and neighbors uh, experience a lot of mental health, a lot of trauma. I was born and raised right here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin right on 7th and Burlock, um, in an area full of crime. And, and uh, it seems like it has changed over the years, but in my time, there was a lot of crime, a lot of trauma, and um, mental health uh, issues all around us. And so for me, this was a very, uh, very passionate area for me to belong to and to give back to the community and be able to educate people on uh, how we can help the community heal and, uh, and become mentally well. Thank you, thank you. With that being said, what do you consider, what is your definition of mental health? What's nice about the definition of mental health is straightforward, right? It's, it's our mental wellness. It's all about um, our psychological um, and emotional well-being when it comes to our minds. And it's, that's straightforward. Uh, it's, it's important to take care of our mental health. And one of the reasons why we're here today. And uh, we're hoping to you know, continue to educate people on what that means. You know, so when I think of mental health, uh, just to kind of piggyback, I look at that as the umbrella term. And I think a lot of times when we talk about mental health, uh, having a stigma to it, that's because most of the time we talk about mental health, we talk about mental illness. So if you look at mental health on the continuum, you have from wellness to illness. And if we only talk about the illness, nobody's ever going to want to talk about that. So I think as a community, when we talk about mental health, we want to be very intentional about being proactive about keeping ourselves healthy. The reason why most of you are looking down and not looking at us is because what are you doing? You're eating, but when you look at the food, what you have before you have something that's adding to you. And I think a lot of times when we think about mental health, it's always like you think about the psychologist's office sitting down on the couch. But we don't think about those other things that's proactive to keep us well, making sure we're exercising, making sure we're eating well, making sure we're sleeping well. So when we think about the little things that we do, we want to let people know that's what mental health is and that's what mental health starts. Awesome. So just in regards to your response, Dr. Smith, um, where do you see the state of mental health within the city of Milwaukee? Y'all want the honest answer? <laughs> <laughs> so I think you can see it in the news every day. Uh, my wife was upset with me on Friday. And why was she upset with me? Because after we just took her children to choir rehearsal, we went to 50 Center. And there was a visit for Jasmine Blake. She was like, I don't, I don't want them out there. I said, well, I don't want them out here either, but I don't want this family to have to be out here. And so as they're around and they come around the community with me, so they get to see some of the highs, they get to see some of the lows. And when I look at what Milwaukee is, you say, well, well, where's the mental health state? You can tell by when you look at the news. And it's not just what happens in the urban communities and sometimes the propaganda that you have you think is all bad, but it's all throughout our homes. When you look at the divorce rates, when you look at the hospital, when you look at these rates, we'll talk about this a little bit early, but when we look at um, adverse childhood experiences, it's something that was created in 1998 by the Virginia Nanda, with Kaiser Permanente and the CDC, but they started to recognize all of these health disparities from people who had had trauma. So when we look at that, we see that all throughout our city. So when we start to look at uh, what's the health of Milwaukee, it's not good. 
And then the real question becomes, what are we going to do about it? Now there's a lot of talk, but unfortunately sometimes there's talk, but there's no walk. And I was always taught when the audio doesn't match the video, there's never be any real solutions. And right now what I feel like is we're like a kung fu movie. You remember those one? Oh, kung fu movie. The government's horrible. And so, so what we have, that's what I feel right now. So when we have conversations, it's imperative for me, and I tell them, I say, when they ask me to speak, I say, you sure you want me to speak? And you want to tell the truth. And so if I don't make you all feel a little bit uncomfortable by the time you leave, I probably haven't done my job. But also, if we haven't said some things that make you a little bit more enlightened, give you some energy, to gather some, some more resources to increase your IQ on this, then we probably haven't done our job. And I think uh, Dr. Jones and myself will do that before the, uh, the lunch and this complete. Yes, definitely. I mean, I agree um, wholeheartedly with, with Dr. Smith. Uh, when it comes to Milwaukee, I mean, we're, we're going through a serious crisis. It is a serious crisis every single day. We're hearing about uh, you know, a different episode of suicide, um, you know, accidents, um, killings throughout Milwaukee County. Uh, most, most recently, it's the, the women and the children. Um, and so when you talk about uh, the state of our, our mental health today in Milwaukee, um, the, the first word that comes to, to my mind is crisis, and the second word is trauma. Mm -hmm. We definitely have to have these kind of discussions. We have to talk about solutions and what that looks like and, um, and, come and try to actually move towards some solutions. Because I think one thing that we have, though, we've been pretty good at talking about it, but we really haven't been do doing good at actually putting some of these things into place. And I know some of the questions are, what are those things? And we hope to kind of talk a little bit about that today. We don't, as panelists, have those answers, right? I have all the answers. But we definitely can help lead this discussion on what we can do. Um, but definitely trauma uh, is what we're dealing with and crisis. So Dr. Jones, I'm gonna um, start with you on this, this next mm -hmm. question. Um, it was mentioned about stigma. Not too long ago. So we're going to take a moment just to talk about stigma around mental health. What are your thoughts around the impact of stigma within the community as a whole? Stigma is huge. Um, you know, when it comes to stigma, many of you have grown up in households like myself where our parents were told us, you know, do not talk about what goes on in this household. What goes on in this household stays in the household, right? Um, do not take this out of the community. And many of us, like myself, who did get whoopings growing up, uh, <laughs> you knew it was coming. If you talked about to the neighbor or to your friends or to anyone else, your teachers. And so we're dealing with a lot of stigmas. It's not just one, but there's hundreds of them that we can sit down and talk about when it comes to stigma. And one of them is kind of keep your business to yourself. What's a problem with that? Because now what we're dealing with is years and years and years of trauma and issues that have been built up inside and people not knowing how to deal with those issues, right? So when we're talking about stigma, there's so many, <laughs> you know, and how it affects our community, hugely. Because if we can't get past those stigmas, we really can't start looking at healing. We cannot look towards healing and mental health, mental wellness, and all these things with stigmas being a factor. So the co goal is to try to break some of those stigmas, uh, hope that the community will start to come out and, and utilize resources like ourselves and other people who specialize in the area that can start to help break down some of those barriers. And so when we think about it like this, uh, you have to think about it from every portion of the community. Mm -hmm. And when we say a stigma, why don't somebody want to, to have it? Because it's something negative that comes with it. Mm -hmm. uh, we look at some of our veterans that came back from Vietnam. Uh, some that might have been connected or uh, addicted to heroin, those who had, had post-traumatic stress disorder and it was undiagnosed. People would always laugh at them, say, this person is crazy, look at him, they're talking to themselves and whatnot. So it's always where, when we talk about mental illness, it was some of the extremes that people wanted to move away from it. But even fast forwarding to today, if you tell somebody you have something, people look at you different. They treat you different. And one of the things, um, I wrote a book called Building a Better Man. I wrote this book with uh, this white man from Elkhorn who never saw a black person until he went to the military, and this gay man from Puerto Rico. And we were very different. That I grew up on 7th and Mill Line. So people were like, how did you three get together? And, and how it was, because we all became psychologists. But when I talked with Hector, he would talk to me about being a gay man and how he had to hide certain things because if people knew, it would have certain consequences. Um, as a, a person who works with professional athletes, there are a lot of athletes that won't disclose information about themselves because they understand the consequences. And one of those are mental health. Because as an athlete, you have a short window. 
Yeah. And if you put somebody believes you have a mental health issue or crisis, that could be an issue. It's just like a foot injury. They don't want to deal with it. They want somebody who's healthy. So when we think about that now in just lay society, the reason why we move away from it is because nobody wants to be seen as a person with a deficit. Times of uh, epochs ago, if you wore glasses, that was a stigma. But not everybody outside is messed up. So, <laughs> but then when we do the glasses, we made them fashionable. We made them with colors. We made things that made it now excitable. But people wanted to wear sunglasses. People wanted to put on sunglasses where it wasn't. And that's what we have to do with mental health. We have to make it fashionable because everybody deals with mental health, whether you deal with it individually or you have a family member. If the statistics is true, saying that one in four, according to the World Health Organization, they will list either one in four or one in five, depending on when you need it, that a person suffers from a mental illness at some point in their life. So that means if we just look aside inside this room, some of us have dealt with it, but yet we put on that mask because what? We understand the consequences of being vulnerable. So when we start talking about stigma, what we have to do is to allow individuals who suffer from mental illness to be able to express it, to be able to give them up, but also to show their gifts inside of it. I have ADHD, but you know what I did? I turned all that energy into something positive. And so now when people say, hey, you don't stop, you don't quit moving. I said, you're right. <laughs> but I do it for something good and something fine. So it's just a matter of what, how do I use what I have to benefit me? So when we start talking about stigma, it's incumbent upon all of us. Because we all can probably think of a time where we gave somebody a side eye, where we had a conversation about somebody that we might be embarrassed to say. So what we have to do is to understand what we can do. And the doctor says something that sticks with me. Sometimes he says, well, I'm just a little person. I can't change the sick, the system. He says, if you think you're little and you can't make a difference, he says, stay in the room at night with a mosquito. <laughs> you know, you think about it. And so the little things that we can do if we just put our power together and then if we do it individually and then collectively come together, we can help to remove stigma seemingly overnight. Thank you both for those answers. Those were great, great answers. I'm going to shift gears just a little bit for you both. So within the number of years you've practiced in your designated professions, um, what are the challenges you face as young black professionals within the community and the city overall? Dr. Smith, Dr. Smith. This is a, a tough question because uh, I think a lot of people within mental health has uh, problems and that's the stigma. I, when I worked at Children's Hospital, I remember it's, it's sexy to say that you work in mental health, but when you start to look at the budget and you start to look at the other thing, you start to see where people really put an interest and a concern. So you say, well, what are, are some of the, the, the issues that you deal with? Some of the issues you deal with is funding. Because you say, how do we fund it? And then one of the, the, the larger issues that, that Kia and myself will deal with is when you're a black person working in mental health. Uh, I don't like being the only black person who's the provider. And I told you about Hector who wrote the book with me. Well, the reason why I work for children is because Hector was the only person of color there. When he left, they needed another person to replace him. And so when you feel that, it's like it's hard to say something. And when you want to have a voice, it becomes even more particularly difficult. Because then if you say something, now you're radical, now you're revolutionary, you're just trying to push the needle to try to make some significant movement. And if you become a radical or, or classified as that, now your words don't have the same effect. So you think about anybody in our society who talks and says something, and if it's a little to the left, they'll kind of put them in that category, and now their words don't have the same meaning. What we have to do inside of here, what I believe is that we can't be afraid to die. And I mean we can't be afraid to die for our careers. Maybe you don't get the investment you want. We can't be afraid to die to, um, as, as it relates to accolades. But literally, we can't be afraid to die. And so when I work with a person, I have a criteria. I said, do they love what they do? Are they willing to literally die for this? Because if you're not literally willing to die for it, you're probably not going to be able to move with me. And so when we start talking about, well, why would you have to die from the death? Because once you start to change the status quo with certain things, you get in trouble with people. I'm not an enemy of medication, but I'm not a fan of it. I think it's overused and I think it's abused. And when you start to say this, if you bring up something with Big Pharma, people don't want to deal with you. Because it's like, oh, this is kind of perfect. But it's the truth. And if you can't be honest and tell the truth, how can we ever have any type of real headway on this? So you say, well, what are the issues? That's one of the issues. And then just being black and all of the over-monopolized. Everything within the book that we read from psychology, I don't like people. 
That's right. You know, nothing is going on black people. So when you start looking at Hispanic populations, and they're not even just on, on colors. This is stuff from 1900s and 1920s. We've had generations that, but we're stuck in this old mold. I love Sigmund Ford, and I think he has some great points. But I think we've moved on for generations, but we're stuck on these relics of the past. And it's just like, what can we do to improve this to make sure that mental health meets the needs specifically of the 21st century? Oh, how do I piggyback off of that, right? <laughs> I'm duplicating what you're saying. Um, we, we talk often, right? And, um, so we share some of the same feelings when it comes to this. I think one of the things is um, not only just funding, but also just the lack of uh, resources or lack of, of, of utilizing us as sort of resources. Um, I have a mental health clinic right on 40th and Capitol, um, where accident just happened yesterday. You probably saw that this morning in the news. Um, and uh, we're right down 40th and Capitol there, Amaranth Counseling Services. And uh, we have three locations. And many times after 16 years of being in business, people say, I never knew you guys were here. Right? Um, and we've been serving the community that long. So uh, one of the things is, is utilizing resources that are out there uh, when it comes to mental health. And I think that's one of the issues that we do have is that there are people who care. There are people who specialize in this area. And we have to start to utilize some of those resources, um, not just AMRI, but there is a group of minority um, mental health professionals that are out there that we recently just started some Facebook pages and trying to get that information out more so that we can be culturally diverse and know that we do exist, right? Um, so definitely funding is a big one. Really hard to, to work for free, right, all the time, right? So we still got bills to pay and everything else. But I think the other piece is that um, being able to have resources for people in need of services. And that's where Milwaukee County comes in at because um, they're much larger than just one entity or one business. And so um, being able to have the resources and not making it hard and difficult for people to get services. One of the issues that I noticed recently is that you have to, yeah, you have to you know, fit a list of 50 requirements before you can even be able to get services. That's ridiculous. That is ridiculous. And that right there just eliminated and put a huge barrier for those who really need the services are unable to receive the services. Many of you may not qualify because of income guidelines. Many of you may not require, may not qualify because um, this, uh, you don't, you didn't have a prior diagnosis, right? Um, but again, like uh, Dr. Smith said, many of us, all of us, not many of us, all of us have are impacted by mental health one way or another. If you have some stressful days, there's something in DSM-5 that talks about stress, right? We can diagnose when it comes to stress. I mean, we all deal with it, and I think we have, we've been having a blind eye to it, and we really have to um, bring that into the forefront. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to take a quick pause because I want to ask the audience, yeah. does anyone have any questions for the panelists at the moment? because there's been a lot of information just within the past few questions mm -hmm. that's been given. So if there's anything that you would like to ask the panelists, please feel free to do so. Any questions? I got one. Yes. Um, is there a way to distinguish between a person with uh, mental health issues or needs and a person that kind of soon seem to have just tuned out in life? A lot, and I ask that question because sometimes I look at our homeless population sure. in our area and a lot of times you approach them some, you can see visibly that they may need some help, and others you just can't really seem to figure out. That's a good question. Um, I think uh, one of the things you said is, what's the difference between someone with a mental health need or a mental health issue and someone who has just tuned out of life? Well, if a person has tuned out of life, there's a mental health need. There's an issue there, right, that needs to be identified. People don't tune out of life just because they choose to tune out of life. Something has happened within their life that has caused them to be that way, right? Um, someone who's homeless, you can imagine, you can, you can only imagine, right? Unless you've been homeless and you can say you've been there, where uh, many of things, many of barriers that they have gotten to that point. Uh, and so if someone has tuned out of life, there's definitely some mental health needs there that need to be addressed. It takes time to peel through those onions. I call peel through the onion, right? Because there's layers of what makes us who we are today. And so that person who has tuned out of life, there's some things there that need to be addressed. There's definitely some mental health needs there. And, uh, and, and the homeless population here in Milwaukee is huge when it comes to uh, an unmet, right, mental health need. And that still hasn't been addressed. And so we're trying to, you know, work, again, work with Milwaukee County when it comes to that. Um, so those individuals can and hopefully be able to change their mindset and, and also help with some other resources to get them out of the position that they're in. 
And just to eliminate what she said, I do a lot of work with veterans. <coughs> so when I look at a lot of my veterans, specifically uh, my people, some still from World War II, very few, but a uh, lot from Vietnam. And from this um, era, this was one of the first wars where soldiers weren't considered heroes, where in fact they were considered enemies. And so they dealt with the trauma of seeing, I don't even want to say what they saw, um, as an 18, 19, 20 year old, and then they come back to the skirt. And then if they were black, they had even more things to be able to deal to contend with that. But now when you don't get help, it's like a snowball. It starts to compound and compound and compound. And what we see is even like, uh, if you look like now within football athletes, now you can't diagnose CTE until a person is dead, but you can see some of the symptoms. But when we look at the things that a football player goes through, we understand the type of hits that they take. <coughs> we understand physical concussions, but we don't clearly understand emotional concussions. Mm -hmm. Now a lot of people are emotionally concussed because they're invisible. They don't get the, the same type of treatment. But those two things manifest in the same way where people having problems not being able to deal because they tried to deal. And you know what we do? We criminalize it because they did drugs. They said that person's a drug addict. Yeah. That's what they were doing to, to try to help. Now, we want to give them some better ideas, but this is one of their needs. They were drinking alcohol, they did something, and because of what they experienced in these traumatic flashbacks, they became violent. And what we do is we penalize the behavior instead of understanding what actually happened. We've all had something that can be considered a mental illness in here. You've never lost somebody who you love through a depression. But the difference is the average person kind of moves on with their life. We establish a new normal. Where then some people, if they're stuck in the illness, they stuck, they're stuck in the stage where you say, man, I think they probably should have moved on from here. And even though there's no real true time limit, it's a time limit where we say, okay, something's not right. You know, if you have a child that's walking at, at six months, you're like, oh, wow, this child's working early. But anywhere between like nine and 13 months, it's like, man, if they're not working at walking at 15, 16, you start to get a little concerned, but they walk, they're there. But if that child is three years old and not walking, something is wrong. And that's how I look at illness. Like, what's kind of a time? And everybody is different, but when it's something that exceeds, and that's where it's time to intervene. But you know why people don't get help? Because of the stigma. People are gonna laugh at me. People are gonna talk to me. People are gonna treat me differently. So you know what? I'll go on with this facade. Even though we both know what's going on, we just both kind of live in this life. And that's how mental illness deteriorates and gets worse. Thank you. Does anyone else? Yes. <laughs> 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 she did. It. She did it. Uh, so real quickly, just on 27th Street, I remember walking, this was a few years ago, I saw an African-American mother. The child asked, Can I, I need to use the restroom. She was walking with her child, and um, she said, well, there's no place to go. She ripped out a child's pants and had made the child use the bathroom on the street. Uh, and I see a lot of things that in this neighborhood that people will say, well, that's a cult. That's how, that's how black people walk. We, I, to me, I think there's, there's things that we've maybe carried over from generation to generation that is not healthy, but we cover it as it's part of our culture. That's what you can address. That may not have been one, but if you can address that in any way, how you see that maybe there's something that's really not culturally that's not, a, it's not a, it may be a tradition, but a culture that's not who African Americans are. Um, it's a mask. It can, it, you know, and a lot of times what we do is we mask and we try to find reasons why we do what we do, right? Um, and when I hear people say that uh, that is due to cultural, mm -hmm. um, many times uh, they're not even educated in the, that culture, right? Um, cultural diversity, right, uh, is, a, is a big issue. We're constantly having trainings on cultural diversity because what does culture mean, right, from one person to another? <coughs> And so uh, one of the things is that uh, understanding where individuals come from, right? Understanding what their personal culture is. We put a, we put a bias out there. Um, and that bias is whatever we might think in our mind, what it might be. And the first thing we do is judge. We don't know why that occurred, right? There could have been many reasons why. Um, maybe they did resourcefully look for a restaurant and couldn't find one, right? Um, maybe there was some medical condition that was causing that child to have to go right away. We don't know, but the first thing we do is we judge. And then we try to say, oh, but that, well, that was culture. That's a different culture. I've seen it before. Well, you've seen it from one person or two people, or maybe you've seen it on the news or in a movie. And then now you've already set some bias in your mind that that's what black people do, right? And, and we're, we're talking African American, but we <coughs> think bias is about all cultures. And that's one of our issues that, that stand before us today, which uh, doesn't allow us to be able to move forward. We were having this discussion 
in the uh, in the lobby there is that we have to get past some of those racial biases, some of the cultural uh, uh, differences, and be able to understand that mental health is one thing that affects all cultures, all walks of life. Doesn't matter how old you are, doesn't matter where you come from, right? Doesn't matter how you were raised or what beliefs were instilled in you. You will be affected by mental health if you haven't already. And so that is what we have to, to get past. And once we get past that, I think we can start moving ahead to having some more success with how we can help people be mentally well, work on the front end of mental wellness instead of on the back end of dealing with a mental illness. And I just want to add one thing because I think you hit it on the head. I want to make sure they heard it. Culture. I think it's a culture of poverty. So when you start thinking about where a person lives, am I going to maximize that person's potential or am I going to minimize it? You know, we're all drinking water, but we know about the land water issue. We know about the land in the paint. We know about the land in the soil. We know about the food deserts in which we live in. We understand when a parent is pressed that what could happen. Now there's sleep deprivation. Now there's not a lot of different things going on. Now there's pressure. Now there's frustration. And when, we, when you look at the work of Dr. Bruce Perry, he'll um, put up an MRI images of a, of a child, three-year-old. And he'll pose a brain two three-year-olds, one that's gone through extreme neglect and trauma, and one that's lived a pretty normal, healthy life. And you can see the changes in the brain already. And the brain grows sequentially, so you've got to understand that 90% of the brain is developed by the age of five. But that, that part that grows is like your limbic system, so that's your visceral response, your, your emotions, your reaction. So a lot of the things that, that's even pre-verbal to us that we can't even articulate is why we react the way we do on a visceral level. Now the latter part of the brain doesn't develop until you're 25 to 28. That's the prefrontal cortex, the part of our brain that's associated with executive function, delayed gratification, problem solving, all of these things. So when you have a person whose brain has been tainted from the very beginning, it's like you know a trajectory that's put it on the wrong mark. So when we start talking about things that we say, I was wondering if that was my wife, she might have did that one. <laughs> <laughs> we had we, our twins, our, our ten, the baby girl was nine, so it's like having triplets, so I could see her. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously. That's <laughs> also what that we said. We said assumptions and whatnot. But literally, it's like um, when, when you grow in a culture of poverty, you don't you don't maximize yourself. And even if we go just a little bit deeper, there's certain insults that we get that we just don't know. We talk about micro aggressions and implicit bias. When somebody says, Dr. Smith, that makes my soul cringe. Because I know where the name Smith came from. I don't take pride in that name. That's not, that's not my ancestor's name. It's, it's nothing about that. But when you carry that on, it's always an insult. But what I recognize is just like, I don't like my name and what I care. It's something that everybody in this room has, something that somebody insults you in a way in which they don't even stand. And sometimes in a way subconsciously, you don't even understand. Sometimes we do something, we say, why did I do that or why did I react that way? Because it's something from a visceral response and that comes in from a culture of hurt in the beginning where we couldn't articulate it. Kia said before, it's so hard to get mental health services. I couldn't see a child unless something was wrong, which is absolutely ridiculous to me. So I gotta give him a diagnosis or her diagnosis the first day. I said, why can't a child come in and see me like they would their regular primary doctor? Mm -hmm. See me once a year. So if something happens, guess what? We know where we can go to. But now what do you have to do? Nothing's wrong. Now I'm in a crisis. Now I got to try to trust somebody. I don't know what information, whether or not I know I want to trust them, whether or whether it's not this is the right person for me. So we do things that make mental health bad. So people get into those accounts and say, I'm not going to do it. Because if I want to do something, and then the first experience I have is bad, that validates what I want. And not only do I not do it, I spread that seed all around. So when we start thinking about why did things happen, it's a lot of different things. You look at the ACE studies that I talked about before, but what they'll talk about, ACE is start when you're born. And they say, what insults did you get? But there's another intergenerational where it says, what are the things that happened to you before you were born? We're talking about epigenetics. So if you are, are a member of the Jewish community and your family was in the Holocaust, that lives in your gene. If you're a Japanese person here in America and one of your grandparents was in an internment camp, that lives in your gene. If you're an African person from the diaspora, if you're an indigenous person, those things build up in your genes. So when you come out, it's already issues that we're dealing with that we haven't even thought about. So when we start thinking about what do we have to do, how can we become proactive from the beginning? And I tell people this because I talk about dying for things and doing whatnot. I think the answer to everything is love. And I think the more that we put love out, the more that we start to see a panacea for a lot of the issues that we have.
Yeah, I like that song. <laughs> 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 okay. Uh, yes, I have a question about treatment. Uh, uh, I'll tell you. We had treatment centers. Yes. Uh, we had. It started at 7D in Milwaukee County Hospital, where they were diagnosed. The police would bring people there, and they were diagnosed. And then you had Mental Health North Division, South Division, Northwest, and then it became the Mental Health Complex, Child Adolescent Treatment Center. We had all these places, and then people were getting equity in their treatment because all people were treated the same, treated and fed and kept there. So with, through privatization, they put it in, out now out into all these different little places all over the city, a uh, housing with people with mental disease. Do you feel it is more advantageous? And the word came out that they were warehousing the patients, okay? Do you think it was better to be warehoused or to be out here being killed, jailed, and killing other people, killing yourself, and now that it's going on in society now? I started to work in mental health in 1967 when this was the type of treatment that we gave and looked after people and took care of them. And so I just wanted to know, do you feel this is more advantageous, the privatization and all the different little houses, they are putting them all over the city and there's no equity in treatment and everybody don't treat them the same way. I'll let you answer, but just before we say anything, I just want to say thank you and I honor you for your service and what you did. I appreciate that question and that historical lesson. I just want to and the say other thing, you. right now I'm on the school board with our children in Child Adolescent Treatment Center. We're trying to treat them in our schools. And, and just yesterday, a child pulled up a stop sign and broke a window in one of the things. And these type of behaviors are occurring. Now that I'm on the school board and I see these things, even our children, the Child Adolescent Treatment Center, how can the school take care of these issues? Thank you. Uh, this answer, the question is two parts, so I want to definitely address the first part. Uh, and uh, the process of removing individuals from the mental health complex and the mental health community was done all wrong, okay? And um, it was done very abruptly very quickly, and I think a lot of the uh, agencies can be honest and say, they weren't ready, okay. right? Uh, we're not ready, staffed with the individuals that uh, need, you know, psychologists, uh, medical professionals, uh, those that can uh, administer medications appropriately, and but was forced to help, and was forced to uh, be at the need of Milwaukee County. Now, many times we are um, given a task and we have to go with the flow, right? Um, I really believe that that was a situation that happened to happen quickly. Do I believe they're doing a good job? Absolutely. Do I believe that they are working in the best that they can? And I'm talking about some of the um, the, the individual places that the people actually got to, in the community and went to. So I think that um, the process and how it happened was very abruptly, and I think that that came from a lot of um, some of the um, things that were happening at the mental health complex, right? Um, and many of you know that there were many lives, right, that where people walked inside the hospital and never came back out. And um, when we talk about liability and we talk about not having the answers, I think that that was mere a decision that was made. It took the liability off, and that liability then becomes a liability of these individual agencies that they're housing people in. I think that there's definitely more training that needs to be uh, done, um, and I think that they're working with the resources that they have um, but was that the best decision? I, I, I can't say, right? Um, and, and I think that it was definitely done without a, a lot of um, a lot of uh, thought, right? Um, and it was more of a, a decision to when, when you're up when you're up against the wall. I think that was a quick decision that was made. And so I definitely think that we do need to have uh, more extensive, higher level care services, such as mental health hospitals, that can truly accommodate those with severe mental health needs. We don't have that. We have. Them. Right? We don't have that. And then the second part of her question was regarding the schools. I'm going to let uh, Dr. Smith talk about that. He might also have something to add about the, the last one. 
So, and we'll get to your question, I see. Yeah. So I'm, yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give you two words. Uh, one is capitalism, uh, and the second is fraudulent capitalism. <laughs> and so when we start to understand, when we start to look at what capitalism is, I think in its pure sense, it's beautiful if you have a fair playing ground, everything is right. But when you have fraudulent capitalism, now you're starting to see how can we start to profit off of people. And when we look at that decision, I don't think it was mainly uh, about the health of the people, but how can we make money? Um, when we look at the coincide, how that coincided with the prison industrial complex, I think a lot of people understand that our correctional facility had became a de facto mental health institution, so you have all of this. And then you have people say, hey, you know, what's the best way to make money now? They, so you got group homes, you got foster all treatment right. homes, all right. right. And it's not people who necessarily care about the people who had the best skill set, but it was a quick way to make money. And as long as you could, I used to work in the schools, and I'll get to that question. When I worked in special education, they just wanted us to warehouse the children. As long as they didn't make any noise, you were a great teacher. As long as you had your IEP completed, whether you did it or not, they didn't care. As long as it was completed, you were there. So to answer that first part, that comes in with capitalism. That, that's a monetary decision. Right. As it relates to the schools, I think um, so much is put on the schools that they can't handle it. I think there needs to be collaboration. Whenever you look at collective impacts, those are the things where you say, you know what, everybody has a name, but just how are we connected? We can't be siloed, but everybody has a specialty. And I think schools are supposed to be for learning, but what have they become? They become everything. Uh, great teachers have become de facto case managers now, and so they have to do that. And because mental health is such an issue, an overwhelming problem, they want to bring it inside of the school. But this goes back to what we were saying before. If we could do some things proactively, how much could it be? So just think about this. I paid for my first daughter, who is now 14. I paid more for her first year in daycare than I did for my entire four years at the University of Wisconsin Whitewater undergrad. But she didn't come out speaking three languages. She didn't come out with a degree. She didn't come out with anything. But if we understand that the brain develops between zero to five and ninety percent, but this is where those neurons are firing, and this is the best time to learn. This is the best one. But why don't we? And this is for politicians watching on Facebook. Why don't we create a policy? Maybe if we don't change the compensatory age, well, why don't we have schooling that starts at six weeks old? We have it for birth to three, but why do you have to have a defect before you get extra help? Right. We see in Montessori schools, they start at three years old, and we see some of the great things they do for non-traditional learning. What if we understood the impacts on the community that was there, but we started children learning at six weeks, where they had the parents, where they had educators, and, and I love a lot of our daycare workers, but some of them are not equipped intellectually from an academic standpoint to really guide them to another thing. What if we had our best educators, our best minds, working with the children at the time when we get the best bang for the buck? And this is where you start to see if we really want to make a change, we have to do something revolutionary. We can't keep doing the same thing. If we understand that by the time the child is five, that brain is already set in a certain way, but now we're putting good money after bad money. Why not move a little bit forward? Fast forward, we have a lot of our children who are not completing school. Or even when they get a degree, some can't read. Some can't be able to do the things to really maintain the society. So we're losing them on the back end anyway, so why not put that money forward going forward? And I think that stops some of the problems. When you see a child take a stop sign and put it through the window, I'm not going to be able to do nothing with that child. She's not going to be able to do anything with that child for 45 uh, minutes every week. There's some other deep-rooted issues of what we have to understand. It's societal in nature, and unless we all collectively come together, we're going to continue to say the same thing. And I'm just at a point now where it's like, I'm, I'm sick of saying, hey, let's do this and let's do that. And then we put money after the same things that don't work. So we've seen where our budget has been for the past 20 years. We've seen there's been no results. Why don't we shake it up? Why don't we shake it up? So, so when we start thinking about those things right there, I think it's because we're so caught up in the status quo, and this goes back to what I said, being afraid to die. Mm -hmm. A lot of people who work in positions say, well, you know, when I'm close to retirement, I'm not going to lose my pension. I'm, I'm just going to ease this out, let it go. People say, well, no, I want to move up the ladder, so I got to kind of play the game. And then nothing ever changes. The status quo remains. Maybe there's individual success, there's some stories. And, and what I hate is when you go to these programs and you have these big fundraisers and you see the board and, and this this child that's done some great things and, and that's beautiful for that child. And it's like, that's not the masses. The starfish, there, everybody familiar with that story? The child sees the starfish and says, you can't make a difference for them all. I said, but I can make a difference for this one. That's horrible. Let's think about it. What if that was the mama starfish and you didn't take her away from the four other babies that was there? You know, that's that's that egotistical thinking. And what if that was the one that said, I don't want it. I, if, I, if all my people die, let me die with them. 
Why can't we get a big sand blaster to come and then move them off? This one thinking theory has got to stop. And until we're really ready to do something radical, revolutionary, in the midst of love, we're going to continue to see the same things. We look at every great republic, every great society. I don't care whether it's the pharaohs of Egypt, it's the czars of Russia, it's the emperors of China. Everybody had a kingdom that they thought could never be destructed. That would always go on. But because of the greed of those at the top, and when we look at the income inequality that we see here within the United States, we see where we're going. But for some reason, we're arrogant enough to believe that we're going to be something different than every other great um, civilization, every great kingdom, every great, um, if you want to say, empire has been able to do. We're going to be able to overcome that. The one thing that America can do that no other kingdom could do, no other kingdom ever had the power of nuclear weapon. Think about Rome. Think about Nero and all the stories we had. Do you think if he had nuclear capability and he saw Rome going down and every other place when it went down? So when we started to think about this, we almost have to think about it in a doomsday apocalyptic scenario like if America goes down, that's really the end of society as we know it. And people say, oh, well, that's kind of a far out thing, is it? So as we started to approach our thinking, we got to say, I have to do something because not just me, but for the sake of my posterity, for those who come after me. Because if we can kind of grace out and move out gracefully, what happens to our children, to our grandchildren, to our unborn children that's coming down? And I, I went way over on that. I know we had a question. I don't know if you got your question about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was. Um, what to get back to your, to your instance, I'm going to age myself a little bit in because my mother probably worked with you there. Um, but I remember what happened. Um, I was the state of at the time. And the reason why the county allowed all those people to be put out was the federal law. The federal law stopped Medicaid payment of about $30,000 per person to any county facility for mental health. The money was supposed to follow, and, and it was at that time, it was Senator Kennedy's law because they, they did look at people as being warehoused. But the money did not follow the people to the community. It was a lie. And every two years, there's a budget. Mm -hmm. You can't guarantee somebody's money after that time period. Mm -hmm. So all these good plans were made. Other people came into office and decided the money would not follow these citizens, these mentally ill citizens. They ended up in prisons. They ended up in places they shouldn't be. And we still are using that same system. And um, the money is just not there for them. Um, and we see, we see the ramifications of it now. And my mother and we worked together at Milwaukee County. I can remember my mother fussing at me because I was a state ombudsman at the time. And, and I, was, I would come out there and give them citations because they would lock the bathrooms. And that was against you know, patients' rights. And my mother said, well, you come and clean it up when they stuck there. You know. She said, we're taking care of them. We're making sure they eat. And um, they're not on the street in the cold. In some ways, now I look back at it and I say, if we didn't get that money, we shouldn't have done it. Because we were paying for that. Right. Yeah. And, and would they still have no account committees and the directors who have paid big money, big time money, to oversee houses all over the city? Many are in Franklin. And we find people that are complaining about these people out on the street walking and disturbing them in their homes and everything else in all of the city of Milwaukee, different little houses up. And there is no equity in the treatment of them at all. There's no, not enough people to follow. That, that's part of it. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. And if anyone has any additional questions after um, the luncheon, please take time to speak with the panelists. Um, they will definitely be more than happy to answer any other questions that you may have. The very last question that I have for you both, because <laughs> um, please believe we have a lot of questions. <laughs> but um, in the essence of time, before we end for the afternoon, could you both please just take a quick moment 
um, to provide a word of encouragement for those that may struggle with mental illnesses and have a desire to overcome their battles or know someone who does. I'll start. I just need to talk. So. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. He gets deep, don't he? He's going to be happy over here. That can be a loaded question, right? And definitely, this is just not enough time to say it all, but I will say that um, support people who are suffering mental illness. We can, we can be the first people in this room to commit to not being judgmental um, and to help break some of that stigma, right? And there's a saying that people used to, I used to hear this all the time, treat others the way you want to be treated, um, but I don't see that happening a lot. And uh, we have to take mental illness serious, and we, and we don't do that. Um, you read things on Facebook, you read things on Instagram, and these other social media platforms, you hear your coworkers talk about some of the things that they go through. Lend a helping hand, a hug, a kind word. Um, you know, be supportive, be an op opening ear, provide them with resources. Uh, you know, that's really important that you don't hear some of these things that are happening and some of, the, some of the things that people are dealing with in their life and then have a blind eye to it. Many of the, the, uh, the suicide instances that have occurred, you'll hear that someone knew about it prior to it happening. There was some type of post that was put up, right? Or a friend that knew what they were going through, but nothing was ever done about it. We have to stop being silent. Mental health is not one of the topics where you have to be silent. If you know someone that are dealing, is dealing with something seriously and it's affecting their daily functioning, they need help. And so what I charge uh, everyone in this room is to step up and uh, you know, help those who might be dealing with mental illness. And lastly, to just really look at yourself within and how you personally view mental illness and mental health, right? And if you say to yourself, I don't have any mental health issues or I'm good, I'm fine, and, I need you to come and see one of us. <laughs> right? That's a red, a big red flag. That's the first thing that we need to address, right? Because you cannot help other people if you can't help yourself. So think about some of your own trauma, some of your own uh, biases, uh, some of the things that you've dealt with that you see, right? Um, let's start to address those issues and moving forward, really support people. And then overall, support, support the community because it's not just one of us, it's all of us collectively that can actually put an end to stigma and help Milwaukee County become better, right? So we can talk about the things that they haven't done and the lack of, but we're, if we're not actually playing a role in actually moving forward and taking some of these steps, as far as having mental health clinics, having these kind of conversations, thank you for all being here, first of all, because I mean, that's the start right there, um, but really being at the forefront of helping those who you know are dealing with mental health. Don't talk about them behind their back, but, but yet get them some help. <clears throat> I'm not to be real quick. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, it's, it's just two things. Love, love uh, yourself if you're suffering from mental illness. Love others who are suffering, who are dealing with mental illness. And the second thing I'll remind you with my maternal grandmother, Daisy May Cockerham told me the best way to heal yourself is to help others. And it's um, biological. The serotonin, that the neurochemical transmitter, dopamine, uh, all of epiphenephrine, all of these things that are feel good, uh, uh, neurochemical transmitter. When you do good, it builds it back up. Number one uh, medication we give out is depression. It's an SSRI, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. But our body builds that naturally. So every time we smile, we just increase it. Mm -hmm. And so when I smile, I saw most of you smile because it's, it's reciprocal. <laughs> just increase your serotonin. So what we say the best way to heal yourself is to help others. Because when you do good to others, it's a good one. Well, thank you both for those answers, and this concludes our panel discussion for this afternoon. So, you can see the Let's give the panel a hand. Before we wrap this up, if you've got a stay, we'll take a few pictures afterwards. I do want to say we can skip a shout out to Shirley Ellis, which we're going to go to the board's office. Keep fighting a good fight, keep yes. doing the thing. Yes. We need you, we need her, and uh, we're looking forward to being here <laughs> next year. Uh, also, our, our MPS supervisor, our board, uh, Andy Woodward, it's good seeing you in the building. also want to say what's up to Chief uh, 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 Edith Hudson. She's been absolutely amazing with Marquette University PD, just an amazing support, and we appreciate your support. 
I think that if I miss you, please forgive me, but I want to make sure I reach out to the people I saw. It. So my buddy Mark he couldn't even recognize him. So um, with that said, that concludes the program. And I'm hoping that we can get a couple of pictures with Shelly and, uh, and, and, uh, and if we can have a couple of pictures with you, that's okay. But thank you for coming today, today's event.